Deep, courageous, and extremely smart is how I described Joe Lonsdale after I first met him. Joe is the founder of Palantir, a Silicon Valley success story, as well as an investor in many other tech companies. He currently runs a massively successful VC firm, but perhaps what's most exciting is that he's starting a new university in Austin aiming to bring back civil discourse, teaching the importance of Western civilization and many other fundamental lessons that are missing in most colleges today. So Joe, it's so great to sit with you today. The first time I heard the name Joe Lonsdale was when I was reading an article about one of the businesses that you founded, Palantir. And frankly, I was shocked because I heard that there was this entire commotion over folks in Silicon Valley being very upset that Palantir, uh, a cutting edge tech company, was providing services to U.S. intelligence and possibly ICE and border and I was surprised because I thought that folks that live in the United States would want uh, Palantir to support military and have better intelligence for our own people. But for some reason, folks in San Francisco didn't feel the same way. And I'd love for you to react on that. You know, there are a lot of people, obviously, who are very thankful for Palantir, even in the Bay Area, and who are very positive on it. I think my co-founder, Peter Thiel, had supported uh, President Trump, which was very unpopular in the Bay Area. And, you know, they needed something to be able to protest. And Palantir for them became a symbol of President Trump and a symbol of immigration policy because one of the 90 customers of Palantir and the federal government at the time was ICE, which is, ironically, you know, Palantir signed a contract with ICE during President Obama's time and was still working with it when Trump came up. And so people wanted an excuse to protest against Trump, and that was what they protested. You know, I'm obviously really proud that Palantir's helped catch a lot of bad guys, save the government billions of dollars. And, you know, it's a very mission-driven company with thousands of people working hard on these important problems, as you said. It's kind of funny now that you have the Ukraine situation and Russia and everything else. All these people are like, oh, I want to work in defense. I want to help. And I'm like, well, you can't just do it at the last minute. You actually have to be building these things the whole time if you want to secure the country. And, you know, I'm, I'm really proud Palantir's been doing that. What does Palantir actually do? So Palantir was created after 9-11, and it is an information technology system that helps run the core kind of data and collaboration for analysts in over 40 countries. So it takes in data from thousands of different sources. It works with thousands of different databases that are set up in all sorts of intelligence agencies all over the world. And it helps, you know, human analysts extend their their minds into the information. Because it, you know, if you have someone who's not trained in computer science and you have thousands of databases and they have to try to figure out what's going on to f- see what the bad guys are doing, to see what the you know, potential enemies and adversaries are doing, how do they do this? And Palantir creates that infrastructure that makes it intuitive for them to make sure it defends and protects civil liberties and you only see what you're allowed to see, but make sure you can automatically connect to everything. I mean, that's amazing. And it's also one of those you know, perfect examples of how the free market can produce great technology that could be helpful uh, in defense where, you know, it's very possible that the government can't come up with those great technologies on their own. Well, we saw, we saw after 9-11, the government was wasting tens of billions of dollars on stuff that was 20, 30 years behind. And really Silicon Valley had gotten so far ahead that we realized it was our duty to get together some of the best and brightest from Silicon Valley and apply that technology. You know, in the, in the data problems we had to solve, were really difficult. And it turns out, you know, today Palantir makes about half its money in the commercial world, in the Fortune 500 world, because we solve these problems, you could also apply to some other problems in the real world. And so the folks in Silicon Valley were basically upset because it happened to be that the contract was signed when Donald Trump was in office. I mean, it's funny because I had a conversation with a friend of mine a few weeks ago who really doesn't like Donald Trump Mm -hmm. and she loves hamburgers. Uh-huh. And so I said to her, do you know that Donald Trump loves hamburgers? Maybe you won't be eating hamburgers anymore. Yeah, I mean, it does feel like that silly. There's some, there's some bad logic. Pal- Palantir was already very successful well before Donald Trump came into office, where the company's now 19 years old. Um, people, you know, in, in the Silicon Valley, there's about 5 or 10% of the people who are on the pretty extreme left, and they're really loud, and they really like to attack people. And so, it's, you know, Silicon Valley as a whole doesn't dislike Palantir, but but there's this extreme minority that's very loud that kind of dominates the culture there. And because it was tied to Peter Thiel, because it was tied, 
frankly, it's, frankly, it's a pro-US, pro-US allies mm -hmm. country. It's a patriotic company. Uh, a lot of these people do not like patriotism, right? The American flag offends them is the way it works. So, so, so yeah, so they didn't appreciate it as much. But, but I, overall, I think it is appreciated. I mean, you talk about this extreme left that just becomes, is becoming more and more powerful in so many other areas. I mean, Palantir, I, mean, I feel like the extreme left has become more and more pow powerful in places like New York, California, uh, in education, in media. And so they're no longer this like extreme fringe uninfluential people. They're very, very loud and they seem to have so much influence because people are afraid of them. Leaders have no courage and they're afraid of them. That, 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 that really is what really gets me. I think the moderate left is terrified of being called out by the extreme left. And so they kind of couch out to them and go along with them. And you, you, I, think, I think, frankly, I think you see that in the moderate right sometimes where there's certain things they give into on the far right as well. I think the left's a bigger problem just because they tend to have conquered our important institutions. And so, and, you know, the, the media institutions, the universities, a lot of government bureaucracies, uh, you know, have been taken over by some of these groups. And that, that's really scary. Yeah, it is. Um, so you're a man of action. Uh, you could just sit back and relax. Uh, but the first thing I think you've done is leave California, right? I mean, recently you've left California, you moved to Austin, uh, and you didn't leave quietly. You left with a message, right? Yeah, and so you clearly true. wanted people to think about what is happening uh, in places like California. So tell me a little bit about how did you come to that conclusion that you need to leave? You know, it's something we've been talking about for a long time. I really like the way that America is structured with laboratories of democracy, right? There's 50 states, and the whole point is you try different ideas in different states, and you say, here's what works, here's what doesn't work. And a lot of what California has tried over the last 20 years has been disastrous. It's created, you know, really difficult living standards for anyone who's not extremely wealthy. When we would hire staff in the Bay Area, people would have to commute an hour, hour and a half to come mm -hmm. work with us, which is, is really disrespectful to their lives. And, you know, if you try to build new things in the Bay Area, it's nearly impossible. You have the government's really powerful. And it's been captured by special interests. So, you know, 40% of the land in, in the Bay Area is preserved is just for cattle. And, and yet you have people, you know, driving by empty fields where they're not allowed to build houses. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, frankly, it's just been very difficult in California to get anything done. They have a very, very powerful two-thirds majority of the left in the, in the legislature there. And the way it works is everyone who works for the government, and there's over, you know, I think over 5% of people, over 2 million people work for the government there. They, they, they have to give dues to the far left. So you get this, like, infinite wall of money kind of supporting the far left to control California. And, and you've seen so many mistakes that they, that they make when they're in charge. You've obviously seen that, like, keeping kids from going to school with COVID. You've just, you've just seen all sorts of special interests running and ruining the place, making it tough to build businesses. Culturally, I didn't really want to have to have arguments with my, you know, with my ki kids' teachers as we start to raise our kids with some of the crazy things they're trying to push in the schools there. And, you know, I always consider myself socially liberal in the past. And I consider myself socially moderate now because I think socially left means th there's just crazy stuff going on. There's like t t teachers yelling at kids because they only believe in two genders, right? So there's just all this combination of things that make it so that, you know, part of our duty as citizens is to support systems we think are functional and that are going to lead to human flourishing and to lead to more people succeeding in our society. So I want to leave from a dysfunctional place and put my money and my resources and my hiring into a place that was functional. Yeah. I mean, there's a whole nother level of a duty when we become parents, right? We really start thinking about the environment and the world that we're creating for yeah, our what kids. Yeah. What are we teaching you guys? I have so many friends who are like, yeah, I have teenagers in San Francisco and they're crazy and I don't know what to do about it. And they've been brainwashed and it's that's terrifying. That's so to me. hard. I, yeah. agree. I completely agree. Uh, I got to ask you uh, a very honest question, and that is: so you left California. Is Austin that much better? Because uh, <laughs> okay, so PragerU has run out of uh, California. Mm -hmm. Where I say I, I say it's the belly of the beast. Uh, you know, we do need to fight where some of the problems emanate from. Yes, uh, and I do believe that Hollywood is very much so. Where much of you know much of this like woke culture uh, starts. And so we're there and my staff is constantly telling me we got to leave. Uh, our viewership is constantly writing in emails saying, why are you guys still there? And, uh, and so here you are. Is it better? Uh, Austin is much more tolerant, actually. It's very interesting as a city. There's people here on the right. There's people on the left. You're not you're not seen as a bad person if, you, if, you're, if you're on the right, like you are in the Bay Area in the same way. Whereas the Bay Area... You know, and people people invite each other to dinner here, even if they disagree on politics. In the Bay Area, if you fought on politics, you're you're a bad person, right? And you're not not welcome anymore. Um, you know, zero percent capital gains and zero percent income tax here. 
there's, you know, it's, it's easier to build things. A lot of my friends who have moved here were all building. Mm-hmm. There's like, there's more, much more cranes up here than in the Bay Area. It's a, there's tons of open land to build. So yeah, there's lots of really positive, cool things about Austin. Uh, there are definitely challenges with, uh, with the politics in the city itself and with the policies. You probably saw my friends and I helped pass a, a camping ban. We reinstated the camping ban downtown because, you know. In or tw- the urban camping. In 2018, the progressive mayor wanted to copy SF in LA. He wanted to get lots of funds for his causes. So he tried to show people capitalism doesn't work. And he put all the tents downtown. Homeless death skyrocketed. Drugs skyrocketed. Sex trafficking skyrocketed. But we turned it around. We, t- we turned that off. And, and you know, the, it, Texas doesn't put up with this kind of nonsense. The state also passed a camping ban to say, no, not okay. So, you know, the, gov- the government here is definitely a lot more functional overall. Yeah, I mean, also the weather is a little difficult here. That is fair. That is fair. I think during the summer, maybe uh, maybe people should be traveling other places. <laughs> um, so you're you're definitely unique in in that some of the folks that even support PragerU or that I speak with um, are either quiet supporters or don't want to get involved in the fight. Uh, and many folks that have done very well financially for themselves can continue to live and thrive in the current in our current mm-hmm. society, right? They can go and hire their own guards. They can live wherever they want. Uh, they can, you know, have multiple homes. Yeah, their incentive is to have a lot of money and to be quiet. Basically. Yeah, and then they're quiet. But you're not doing that. Why? Well, and it's, it's and I talk to a lot of my friends who tell me, you know, thank you so much for speaking up and for being in the fight. And I'm running this Fortune 500 company. And if I speak up right now, or you know, or I'm working on these things in public then I'll be attacked by these activists and I'll be shut down. And, you know, I think the far left has done a really good job of canceling a lot of people and of, and of showing a lot of people to, they should be afraid to say anything. Um, I, I've, I've done well enough that I think my main incentive in my life overall right now for my family, for my friends, for things I care about is for us to have a functional country over the next 30, 50, 100 years. And the only way we're going to have a functional country is if the most successful people could speak up and could push for the values that matter for our civilization. And so if, if I can't do it, nobody can. So, so that's my job. Or at least if you, if every single one of us says we can't do it, then nobody will, right? And then bad that's things right. will happen because good people don't fight. That's right. That's what you yeah. said. We, we, both, yeah, we both had relatives, you know, tied to the, to the Holocaust. And I think you're, you're right. If this is the general people don't stand up and don't fight, they let somebody else fight. Right. And it's our job to fight. Otherwise, yeah. bad things happen. Yeah, absolutely. One of the things that we also have in common is that we're very frustrated with the current state of America's education system. Um, we're both doing something about it. You're doing yes. something very special and unique. Uh, and so tell me a little bit about this University of Austin, which I hope to send my kids to one day. So just plug in right there. Definitely. <laughs> well, well, we're, we're, uh, we're, off, we're off to a great start. We've raised over $120 million dollars. We're closing on a bunch of land just east of Austin. You know, I, so I co-founded this with Barry Weiss and Neil Ferguson, uh, who you know, both amazed people, and Pano Canellas, our founding president, and then others. And we've had over 30 sen- senior advisors who are very prominent come support it. And it's, it's, it's going great. We had our first seminar this summer. We put a lot of content out about it. But we're, you know, the idea is to create a top university. We're not just trying to create another university. We want to compete with Stanford, Harvard, Princeton, Yale, MIT. Uh, we, I honestly believe it's possible to get the students who would go to those schools to come to this one instead, which you couldn't have done 20 years ago. 20, 30 years ago, I would have told you that. You're like, that's crazy. How could you possibly compete with institutions that have been around for hundreds of years? But people have seen these, these schools are failing on, in so many ways, and they've, they're, they're no longer focusing on meritocracy in so many areas. They're silencing people. Professors there are terrified to speak up. We had over 4,400 professors apply to our school in the first three weeks we announced it was coming. Mm-hmm. People, people want to come work with us. They want a place that fearlessly pursues truth. They want a place that's focused on teaching children about the values of our civilization and why our civilization has worked so well for 300 years and what were the debates and discussions and how to understand those and build upon those when we're trying to solve problems in our society. Hmm. I completely agree with what you said um, that 10 or 20 years ago when we thought of building these new institutions, it, it, it would probably be just completely Impossible. It'd be seen as wacky. Yeah, or like parents would be like, no, never. I'm not going to, you know, go to yeah. something that doesn't Yeah, I was designing have- between Stanford and MIT and Caltech. And then well, I, there, was no, there was no need 20 right. years ago for something separate. Right. But now it's almost like these legacy institutions have just gone, they're created a bad rap for themselves. Well, they, well they've, you know, they, they've doubled or tripled the size of their administrations. And you see the Sam Abrams studies. The administrations are far, far more left, even than the professors, which have also gone more that way. 
and, and frankly, they're intolerant. You know, if you hire a 167th diversity administrator at one of these universities, and there literally is, I mean, Yale literally has more administrators than students now. It's, it's that wacky. And so if you hire that, what do you think that person's incentive is? Their incentive is to cause problems, is to find issues where they're not issues. The incentive is to, to silence those who disagree with them in order to show their power. I mean, it's really crazy where these places have gone. It's so crazy. I, also, I mean, you're, you're an employer. Uh, I am too. And one of the things that I'm seeing is that the universities are not actually producing what we're hoping that they're going to produce. Well, they're teaching children to be afraid of microaggressions. Right. I have an obnoxious tweet I just put out. I said, spare the microaggressions, spoil the child, which, you know, basically, I actually think you should make kids all have to experience lots of microaggressions because you need to yeah, be stronger and you need to deal with it. good for them. You know, sticks and stones will break my bones, yeah. but words will never hurt me. Yeah. This is what we should be teaching. And they're teaching the opposite. We're, we're, we're encouraging fragility. We're encouraging mental health issues. Yeah. We're encouraging them to be silent in the face of any kind of things they disagree with because you're not you're taught not to speak up or right. it just causes problems for you. I mean, it's we're teaching them all the wrong lessons right. at these schools. And I talk to so many people who are like, yeah, we're not hiring kids from there anymore. They're, they just come yeah. out crazy. I agree. I mean, or lazy or not, you know, not critical thinkers. And, you know, maybe they can critically read through a text, the, but they can't actually problem solve. The only students I want to hire from these top schools now are the contrarian thinkers who could, who could tell me why they disagree with right. what was going on there. And you have the courage to still speak out about things yeah, they care well, about. They're not them in the consensus. You know? There are not a lot of those there. They're not, they're not as many. There are still, there are still some. Yeah. And, and so there's, there's still some worth hiring, but it's a lot fewer than, than there were a decade yeah. ago. I mean, the, the, the extremists, the left extremists have created a new market for us. It's the same thing with PragerU. I mean, Never in my mind would I have thought 10 years ago that I'd be able to launch an entire PragerU kids channel where we'd have millions of parents tuning into, you know, simple animations that yeah. we make. But because the left has gone so bad and they've ruined institu legacy institutions that we've yeah. known, now we have an opportunity to build new. Yeah, I mean, we definitely need more choices in K-12. And I think it's yeah. awesome you guys, you guys are doing that. So how is this university going to be able to be above politics in an environment that is full of tribalism. Mm -hmm. My experience has been that whenever we put something out that is not left wing, then it automatically the extreme far left will call well, it the, right wing. Well, the extreme far left is going to attack for sure. Let's, let's be clear on that. I think it's really important to engage with people on both political sides, to engage with ideas on both political sides. If you just hire people on the right, you know, and Hillsdale is a fine university, but we're not trying to be Hillsdale. You have to hire people with different views. You have to open, have debates. At our seminar, for example, we had, you know, we, we want to have difficult conversations. We had what are called forbidden courses. And what, what are some of the forbidden things to talk about right now? The trans issues, for example, are, are forbidden. So we, what we did is we actually included a trans activist with their, who we thought was a very reasonable, smart person with their point of view. And we included a radical feminist who's on the moderate left, but who, but who, but who thinks that some of the trans stuff is, is being discussed about in kind of crazy ways, as, as we probably do. And it was really cool to have them have a conversation and to have debates and to have open questions. And what was really neat is at the end of it, they didn't fully agree, but they actually hugged each other at the end mm -hmm. of it, which I thought was just really healthy that you can have civil discourse, civil discourse. Exactly. Yeah. You, can, you can have the intellectual humility to know that you may be wrong. So right now you're taught to have no intellectual humility. You're taught they're just, they're evil and you're definitely right. And you have to stop them. That's what the left teaches you. Mm -hmm. But I think the idea of intellectual humility is really important for students. Yeah. Fascinating. What will be interesting to see as the student body grows, how you keep that kind of balance of expecting civil discourse where, you it's, know. It's, it's, it's important. I think, I think we're going to have some of the best comedy in our, in our, in our school in the nation because, you know, none of the comedians will go to the colleges anymore because you can't talk about these right, issues. But right. that'd be fun if we can get a place oh, where, where sure. they're comfortable. Oh, for sure. The comedians are going to love you. Gonna, they're going to be more comfortable. <laughs> they can actually, our, our, yeah. our, our first undergraduate class, full, full undergraduate class is expected in 2024. So we're, we're, we're rushing towards it. It's going well. Oh, that's great. Well, hopefully yeah. by the time your kids are older, the, would you send them there or would you send them to Stanford? You know, I, I definitely would much rather they go to the University of Austin. They're going to have to, we're going to be very bureaucratic. So they're going to have to study hard and get good scores to get in. Yeah. Like, you know, after the Supreme Court rulings on affirmative action coming up, you, you may see some of these schools drop meritocracy. Uh, we're not going to drop meritocracy there. Uh -huh. So I, I, hope, I hope some of them qualify to get in. Wow. Well, do you think that if the school gets accredited, then you're going to have to face the expectations that the government would have. I mean, one of the reasons why we didn't accredit PragerU was, A, because we're always a media company, but B, we yeah. didn't want to abide by some of the silly laws and regulations that the government would require. We're going to watch that really closely. Um, one of my 
one of our goals is really to compete against Yale and Harvard and Stanford on their footing. Uh, they really hate this because they see they see they have this kind of reputation for being like a real top school and a real university. And yeah. they're always going to want to tell us that we're not real. I, I, I think it's possible to actually be fully real, fully accredited yeah. and compete on their terms and beat them. But but you're right, we got to be careful with what the rules are and make sure we, we you never want to use regulation as an excuse for doing something wrong. And yeah. So we're going to have a really strong board that figures out how to thread that needle and push back. And I think we could do it. Yeah, I mean, I would say that as a parent and as an employer, I don't really care whether you're accredited or not. It's if true. you actually can create a student body that performs better, that is top notch, that is, you know, critically thinking and problem solving and hardworking. As an employer, who do you think I'm going to call? Yale, who's going to send me the kids who don't want to work or you? hundred percent. I think we'll get top employers either way. I think in order to qualify for, for the loans that we give out for some kids that couldn't afford to go there otherwise and, and things like that, it's, it's helpful to have it if we can. Yeah. 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 Well, I certainly can't hurt as long as it doesn't start you know, pushing it. I'll, be the, I'll be the first one on the board to push back on any of the nonsense. I'm sure so you will. We'll, we'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a good segue into uh, Cicero. Mm -hmm. So you have a foundation called Cicero. Yes. Um, and you invest in uh, many uh, different companies. But why Cicero? Why did you choose Cicero as the name of a foundation? So, yeah, sure. So the Cicero Institute, we have, it's like both a C3 and a C4. So we actually create policy and we get policy passed in different states. And so Cicero, of course, was a great, the Roman statesman, and naming after him is a call both to both to our classical traditions and classical values, which still really matter. I think there's a lot of wisdom in our society from the past you have to look to when making policy today. You know, respecting why are things the way they are, and you know, he was also somebody who represented very thoughtful, courageous statesmen. He he appreciated. He came from a class of commercial interests in the sense that he appreciated business. He, pre he was a you know, really great orator who you, you know, he kind of represents just like a responsible statesman who's willing to die for the right thing if necessary. And so, you know, Cato, Cato was taken and Julius Caesar would probably not be the right guy to name it after. So he seemed like one of the better Romans to choose. But, you know, it's been, it's been really satisfying. We got about 20 laws passed this year in, in the 10 different states we operate in. And we're, we're taking systems, we're taking the values of a free society and we're applying them to solve problems in government. That's great. Well, hopefully those of us who have the fighting spirit for truth, like Cicero, don't end up in the hands of Mark Anthony <laughs> <laughs> yeah. with our head severed. <laughs> he, did, he did have a rough ending. So. <laughs> this is true. Well, it's we'll a good have warning, a better one. It's a good warning to keep in mind. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, tell me about your other investments. So uh, aside from the non-for-profit world, you're still very much in the thick of it and the making businesses uh, yeah. and building them, right? Yeah. I think the, the frameworks we're using are actually quite similar for both. You want to you look at the world and say, here's where it is now, and here's where it could be, you know, if we, if we applied the right answers. And in some cases, that, that could be a nonprofit. That could be a, oh, the system needs better incentives in order to get innovation to fix this area, whether it's how vocational schools work or how prisons work or all sorts of things. And in some cases, it's, there's technology gaps. And so that, that's my original background is, is you, we create companies based on needs in the market, based on gaps that we see that are available. And so obviously Palantir, which we talked about, mm -hmm. was created based on the fact that we saw a giant gap between how our defense industrial complex was working and how it could have worked with better technology to get the bad guys to save money, you know, to, to help out our allies in our, our country. Uh, similarly, there's lots of other missions that really matter from an entrepreneurial perspective. So after the financial crisis, we built a company called Adapar, which I was still chair, which is the leading wealth management technology in the, in the country. And, helps solve and fix a lot of things in finance. A lot of the family offices and groups use it. Uh, more recently, uh, when a lot of people at Google and others stopped going into defense, and a lot of us were worried about this, mm -hmm. we created some companies there. We started something called Epris, which is it's really cool. It's the Epris was the name of the bow of Theseus. Mm -hmm. So it's another call out to yeah. the classics. And it's actually the best electromagnetic pulse company in the world. So it's actually, it can, you heat, you heat gallium nitride when you, with the right way with AI and you could fire a microwave pulse and you could turn off electronics miles away. So, so U.S. and Israel are both really advanced in things like this right now, and, and that's you know it's doing really important work. We're not allowed to give it to Ukraine right now yet, but if we could, you could fly a little drone over those convoys you see. Wow. We could turn off all the cars, trucks, and tanks by firing the chips in them with one wow. drone, which would be fun. So, so that's a fun company. I, I, one more example on the building side is right at the beginning of the pandemic, we realized that the U.S. didn't have enough advanced biomanufacturing capacity, and we weren't sure what the solution to the pandemic was going to be, but it was probably going to be something with cell therapy gene therapy or mRNA. So those are kind of the new things that are going on there. And we created a company called Resilience Bio, purely with, with private money, didn't involve the government at all. We raised $800 million. We bought five plants right at the beginning of 2020. 
and hired thousands of people to scale them to manufacture here in the US these advanced medicines because we knew India, China, et cetera, they weren't going to necessarily give us stuff if we needed it and ended up creating a very large biomanufacturing company that creates the medicines here in the US and ended up, you know, obviously helping out with Moderna and others for their manufacturing. So, so, so doing a lot of things to kind of strengthen the US, focus on manufacturing here, focus on solving these problems here. How, what informs your decision as to what to invest in? Do you invest in people? Is it the leadership? Yeah, is there's, it... there's, there's two things that really matter in venture capital. Ultimately, 8VC, my firm, is one of the top venture capital firms. And there's, I think there's two things that matter. One is talent. So what are the very, very top talent people doing? Just like with a professional sports team or anything else, you got to, you know, you have to track who the best talent are. You have mm -hmm. to get them to work with you. Part in, in the sense in startups, you have to give them enough upside that they care about it, that they feel it, it's theirs. And so you want to have, you know, cap tables, which is who owns it, to be very spread out with the very best talent. So we're always following talent. We're always learning about things from top talent. And then two is kind of the more interesting high level question. It's what's possible now that wasn't possible five or 10 years ago. So if you want to start Uber, right, or, or yeah. Lyft or DD, like that, you, if you did it before a smartphone existed, it doesn't make any sense. Right. If you do it now, you're 15 years too late. It's already been possible. You're not going to build, build a giant 100x company. And so, so we're always looking for what are the new possibilities. And there's a lot of new possibilities, thanks to AI, thanks to you know, the advanced stuff going on in the revolution of biology, thanks to you know, new breakthroughs in defense and other areas, thanks to what's, you know, how logistics is working. So we're constantly studying these industries and, and finding these gaps. Amazing. I find that folks in your position that invest in many different things have kind of a, de a, a general sense of how to turn lemon into lemonade. Uh, and so given this economic downturn that we're looking at, given mm -hmm. the woke industrial complex, given uh, the erosion of uh, America's education system, I mean, all of these things that all of us are just like so anxious about. Mm -hmm. How do we look at something positive? I know that you, you call your show The Optimist, right? Yeah, <laughs> The American Optimist. The American is, Optimist. Is, is and so yeah. let's end with something uh, that those of us uh, who are listening to you can be optimistic about. How do we, you know, what can we, be, what can we look forward to? <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, as an entrepreneur, whenever you have these problems, you, you have big gaps to get created. And, you know, the amazing thing about America is there's so much talent here. There's still so much talent that wants to come here versus everywhere else in the world. And so we have a huge advantage in our innovation economy. This racist economy. country, everybody wants to come here? It's amazing, right? By revealed preference, we are, we are, we are <laughs> the most amazing that? country in the, in, the, in the world. And by revealed preference, more people are going to Texas and Florida, by the way, than anywhere else. So, Where all the so. racists live? <laughs> <laughs> For whatever reason, the whole world wants to be on. there. But it's, you know, you know, every single problem we're facing as a society, there's good answers that involve the values of a free society, that involve innovation. And that's what we're working on with, with venture capital, with, with policy at Cicero. And, you know, I'm, I'm convinced that as long as we keep working together and harnessing and teaching our children these values, we're going to be able to confront every problem we see. I look forward to continuing to watch your work. And God willing, Austin University is going to grow and flourish. And all of us will be able to compete over sending our kids there on our own merit. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for sitting down with me.